G'day and welcome to Snap Happy, the photography show. I'm Jason Edwards. And I'm Maddie Claire Sloan. Jace, this week we head up to one of the seven natural wonders of the world. That's right, Mads. It was great to have you along on our dive expedition to the Great Barrier Reef. I've scuba all over the planet, but I'd never actually dived on our own reef, and it was fantastic. Also coming up, Peter Eastway gives me a masterclass in long exposure landscape photography. This image right here was taken at one of his favourite spots at Long Reef. All this and more on today's episode of Snap Happy, the photography show. Peter Eastway is a name synonymous with amazing travel and landscape photography. He's been in the photographic publishing industry for over 30 years and in 1995 published his own magazine, Better Photography, which is now one of Australia's leading photographic magazines. So I'm here at the Northern Beaches to have a chat with him and to find out what makes him tick. So Peter, what do you love about photography? I don't really have an answer for that. I take photos because I have to. I just love it. It's in, in my blood. And what drew you to it initially? I started taking photos of my friends surfing and in fact I couldn't really understand why you would take photos of anything other than surfing. But over the years I changed my viewpoint and actually I like photographing more or less anything. And you're a publisher as well? My wife and I publish Better Photography magazine and we've been doing that for around 20 years. It's a bit of a lifestyle decision because we only come out quarterly. I don't want to be working too hard. But, <laughs> of course um, not. <laughs> that, that's right. But uh, we, we feel that uh, we're, we're providing the best information on photography for photographers. So you've been everywhere and you photograph some amazing places. What is your favourite place? I always tell people my favourite place is the next place. Yeah. I think if you look at photography as a, an opportunity to you know, create something, you can create it anywhere. I remember getting back from um, Antarctica after a, a month down there and then going to the Pilbara. So I went from minus 10, minus 20 to plus 40, plus 50. And people said, which did you prefer? And I don't have an answer. They're just different. They're both wonderful. I mean, you know, I think you find amazing landscapes all around the world. Just get out there and do it. Where to next? My next trip is up to Arnhem Land. A few of the photos behind me were the shots I took last year and I'm really looking forward to going back and investigating again. Some people think just going to one place is at one time is enough. But for me, if you go back many times, you get different weather, different seasons, and you see things completely differently. So we are in the beautiful Northern Beaches and there is so many options for great shots here. Where are we going to today? It's actually a smorgasbord, isn't it? Because you can go anywhere from Manly up to Palm Beach and each of the headlands has got something of interest. The rock pools are great, the headlands themselves, the beaches. So we're going to wander down just to the end of my street and we're just going to take a photograph looking out over Long Reef. But I want to show you a technique that I use quite a bit and that's to do a long exposure in the middle of the day. And it's just a, a great technique for creating an image with a little bit of difference and that might get people looking at it a little more closely. Perfect, let's go. Okay. So what are we doing with this shot, Peter? How are we setting it up? Well, what I'm looking at is a simple composition. I'm going to put the horizon more or less in the middle and then the foreground water, it's got lots of texture at the moment, but by using a long exposure, I'm going to blur that out. Mm -hmm. and so I'm going to have quite a simple composition where the top is just going to be blue sky, smooth. The bottom left is going to be water, smooth. And then we're going to have all the information of the, the boat shed and the boats in the foreground. So that's the idea that I've got behind. And it's just a, just a matter now of executing it. And we've got this whole beach. How did you pick this one spot? When you come to a location, I find that sometimes you can go straight to the best position. Yep. But more often than not, I find it's a matter of walking around and taking a number of photos. So we might take three or four shots before we get the one that's exactly right. I do like to turn up and take a shot which is a little bit wider because you can always crop in. So we've changed locations. I've looked for something a little bit mm. different. So rather than just the simple water, yep. I've put a couple of dinghies in the, into the foreground. That's great. Um, we've got a little bit of a, uh, a seat up the back there and that could be problematic. But in post-production, we can get rid of that. Yes. Uh, and so I think when, you, when you're looking for photos, it's as much as coming up with an idea and not being put off too much by what's actually in the photograph. Is that cheating? No, uh, I didn't think so either. <laughs> That's good. So what filter are we using here? We're using a, an ND filter. And if you hold it up to the light, you'll see that there's not much that you can see it's through. It's very, very dark. It's very dark. <laughs> this is a, a Nissi 10-stop filter, mm -hmm. and it really limits the amount of light that comes through. 
So if you limit the amount of light, it means you've got to have a long exposure to make up for it. And during that long exposure, all of our waves blur and we get this nice misty effect. Some people love it, some people don't, but I'm one of the lovers, so I think it looks well, great. Well, the photo's turning out beautiful. Yeah, with modern cameras, it's wonderful. You switch to live view and you can actually see the image through the Nissi filter or through any ND filter, and uh, it's, it's very easy to do. Now you use the Wacom tablet in post-production, yeah. do you use it on set? I don't use it on set so much with the landscape work, but I use it immediately after. And that's what's great, is you, you can be here shooting and then you can just sit down, put the files in, and then you can do a quick edit to see whether you've got it right. And sometimes when you're doing really critical work, it's fantastic to be able to look at your images at 100%. Here you can see them on the screen itself, but there's nothing like looking at it on a nice Makes crisp black on monitor. It looks just fantastic. Perfect. Yeah. I'm on the road with Jason in far north Queensland and I've brought with me a fantastic little travel camera, the Lumix TZ90. Now this unit may be small but it definitely packs a punch. With a 20 megapixel sensor, 5 axis optical image stabilisation and 30 times zoom, it's pretty impressive. And that is just the tip of the iceberg, wait till you see what this camera can do. When choosing a travel camera, you need to consider the important things, like does it take a good selfie? Well, for the TZ90, it is an overwhelming yes. The rear screen flips around 180 degrees and it sets the camera to self-shot mode. You can trigger the shutter in a variety of different ways. Face shutter triggers the camera when you wave your hand in front of your face and buddy shutter triggers the camera when it detects two faces next to each other. If you need to include a large group or scenic backdrop, you can even shoot a selfie in panoramic mode. Now this is fun. Once you've taken your selfie, you can select beauty retouch mode, where you can retouch your skin, slim your face, or even make your teeth whiter. And a pretty cool effect for after is you can add makeup like foundation, lipstick. What will they think of next? This camera is so easy to use and it makes taking great photos seem effortless. I'm here at Hartley's Crocodile Adventures and I'm about to go on the Lagoon Boat Cruise. There's over 25 saltwater crocs here and I'm excited. The zoom range of this camera is really impressive. At the wide end we get 24 millimetres, which is perfect for shooting landscapes or within enclosed areas. At the long end of the lens we can get super close to the action with a 720 millimetre focal distance. The image stabilisation allows you to take really sharp images at full zoom, which would not otherwise be possible without the help of a tripod. So after the day's activities, I love to look at my shots and upload a couple to my social media pages. What's great about the Lumix TZ90 is you can actually process and edit the photos in camera. And then I can upload directly to my Facebook or Instagram. And did I mention it shoots stunning 4K video, which makes it great for video blogging as well. If you're looking for a compact yet versatile travel camera, it's hard to go past the Lumix TZ90. Now there's so many more features I could tell you about, but you're going to have to get your hands on one and check them out for yourself. Hi, I'm Peter Eastway. I'm a landscape and travel photographer, and this is what's in my kit. So I have a number of kits depending on the work that I'm doing. If it's travel, culture and people, then I generally take a DSLR kit. I have a Canon EOS 5 DSR, and that gives me 50 megapixels. I've got an 11 to 24 mil, and I just really go through the range up to a 300 mil, which is a 300 f2.8, with a two times converter, gives me 600 millimeter. If I'm shooting big stuff, if I'm going after the, the hero landscape, if I'm looking for large prints on the wall, then I move over to my phase one outfit. I use an IQ3 with a 100 megapixel back and I have two cameras. I have the XF, which is a standard, rather large, medium format DSLR. And I also use a smaller A series, uh, which is basically a little Alpha camera. And that's the camera, that little thin bit there. We've got a large format lens, which sits on, the, on the, the front, most amazing quality. And then I take the back off there and stick it onto there. And that gives me a gain from a very wide to quite a telephoto result, and all with 100 megapixel accuracy. There are always lots of little accessories that photographers take along. I mean, 
I have my blower brush for cleaning lenses and the sensor. I always take along a few extra cards. I uh, shoot with SanDisk cards. And when it comes to filters, I don't use a lot of filters. I do use a polarizer and I use ND filters. ND filters for giving me long exposures. And I use the Nissi filters and they go into a, a filter holder. So I've got a filter holder floating around in here as well somewhere. One of the things that I do like to take is a extension tube. You add an extension tube onto any lens and it gives you essentially a close focus lens. So it lets you get in close for, for bits and pieces of detail. And the most important thing, I think, in any travel photographer's camera bag is the shower cap. I steal one of these at every hotel that I stay in and when I'm out and it starts to rain, I've got an instant cover for my camera. I'm Peter Eastway and that's what's in my kit. I'm here in Kathmandu in Nepal at the Pashupatina Temple. Now I've spent the morning photographing a family cremating a loved one, a father, a husband, a brother, and it's been very, very emotional. If you ever shoot this type of scene, do not do what so many people do and force your way into the environment. These people are going through a very difficult time. So I stayed away and I used the long lens. Now the family knew I was shooting the scene, and they were comfortable with that because I showed them whatever respect that I could. It was incredibly, incredibly moving. But also look at this scene, there is so much going on. It's literally a target rich environment for photography. So if you're not comfortable shooting a cremation, make sure that you look for other things that are happening. People celebrating at the temple, people having breakfast. There's a lot of things going on here. I'll see you at the next time. The Great Barrier Reef is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. It's also the planet's largest coral reef and is made up of 3,000 individual reef systems. Today, Maddie and I are heading out onto the reef aboard the Tusa 6, a custom designed vessel for snorkeling and diving. So Michelle, here we are on the Tusa 6. What can you tell me about the vessel? Well, Tusa 6 is a custom built snorkel and dive vessel. We are surveyed to hold 100 passengers, but we do only hold 60 on a daily basis, just for comfort and relaxation on out to the reef. Give everyone a lot of space to move around. And people dive and snorkel on the vessel? People do dive and snorkel. We do about 60% snorkelers on here. Typically, they'll upgrade to introductory diving, trying diving for the first time on the Great Barrier Reef. And then we have the rest mostly are certified divers. So what can you tell me about the reef? Well, the Great Barrier Reef is one of the largest living organisms or animals, you can see it from space, um, runs all the way up from the top end of Australia around Papua New Guinea all the way down to around Bundaberg. So what can I hope to see today? Well, typically on the Great Barrier Reef we are hoping everyone gets to see the great ape. Some of those creatures include giant clams, sea turtles, sharks, even during this time of year humpback whales, Maori wrasse and the clown and enemy fish Nemo of course, and maybe even finding Dory. Now most of my diving has occurred in other parts of the world, so I'm really keen to see what it looks like closer to home. You would have seen lots of reports about coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. And it's true, some areas are really struggling and some have been decimated. But researchers are also monitoring which parts of the reef are recovering and at what rate. We have arrived at our first dive site, so it's time for me to get geared up. I'm being a bit soft though, I've put on a couple of layers of neoprene i not too used to warm water. I dropped off the back of the boat and descended to the seafloor where I immediately came across a green turtle feeding on plant material in amongst the sand. It was very calm, which allowed me to approach very close and fill the frame using a macro lens. Then I made my way around the bommies. They are covered in coral and surrounded by healthy populations of fish. When I'm shooting close-ups with the macro lens, I'm predominantly looking for textures and patterns in the plants and animals. I'm also searching for obscure creatures that people might easily swim past, or trying to illustrate an element of a recognisable species in a new and interesting way. Keep in mind the closer you are to an object, the shallower your depth of field is, and how much of the scene will be in focus. So I shot that last dive on macro in close-up, so what I'm about to do now has switched to a wide angle lens, so I need to change the ports on the housing so I can put different glass on the camera body. 
When I'm photographing using a wide angle lens on the Great Barrier Reef, I'm predominantly looking for scenes that translate the scope and scale of the reef ecosystems. I might be trying to illustrate a beautiful coral garden adorned in colourful fish and fish nurseries, or potentially highlighting regions that have been decimated by coral bleaching as a result of rising sea temperatures and acidification. Don't be afraid to use a wide angle lens to get close to your subject and fill the frame, especially if it highlights the surrounding landscape. It's time for us to head to our second dive site of the day. This time I'm going to explore the more shallow waters with Maddie. So Jace, you just had your first dive, how was it? Fantastic. Sea turtles, lots of fish, lots of coral. It was a really, really nice dive. And we're about to go for a snorkel. We are, we're going to hit the water together. Beautiful. And take some shots, hopefully. With my handy underwater camera. Now, can you give me some tips on this? Now, these are great cameras. The only problem that you might find in shallow water is that they can sometimes pick up what we call backscatter. Mm -hmm. And that's just particle in the water, but there's ways to alleviate that. One of the things we can do if we're photographing each other is to have enough distance between the two of us. If we're photographing something really close, like a coral or a fish, have only a little bit of distance between the object and the camera, and that reduces the chances of seeing that particle. How was your swim this afternoon? It was warm. Everyone said it was going to be cold. It was warm. How'd you go with the camera? Not bad. I got some cool shots of the steward bubbles coming up. I went down, did a swim around the bommie, and took some wide angles of the, the coral form. See the ray? No. Missed the ray, yep. Yeah, did you get the ray? No. <laughs> we both missed the ray. I've had an absolute mountain of fun today on the Barrier Reef and the Tusa 6 crew were absolutely fantastic. They helped us with everything. You don't need to bring anything along and they were really, really savvy with the diving and the snorkelling and even the photographic equipment. So if you haven't done the Barrier Reef before, don't put it on a bucket list, just get out here. Happy shooting. I'm back in Peru and I'm in the Andes photographing Quechua women. They've been weaving traditional ponchos and rugs and they've been doing this for thousands of years. It's a beautiful art form. When I'm here, I often try and get close-up shots, especially of their weathered fingers weaving the wool. Now, you'll need to get low to do this, even lie on the ground. Use a shallow depth of field, maybe f5.6, 6.4 at the most, and a reasonably fast shutter speed to freeze the action because they move quite quickly. Once you've done that, don't forget to shoot the entire scene. Take a step back and take the lady and the loom. That tells the context. Now, if you get a little bit caught up and you don't know what to photograph, step back for five minutes and just watch what's happening. You'll quickly see that there'll be ladies dyeing the wool, spinning spools, talking, engaging, laughing with each other, and those make fantastic images. Don't be afraid to experiment. But keep in mind that they're working and you really don't want to interfere with the process. So be discreet and be polite. Happy shooting. So Peter, how important is post-production in the presentation of your images? I think that uh, post-production is fundamental. I mean, in the old days when we used film, there was still somebody at the lab who used to fix up your colour, your exposure yeah. and just get it right. And that's our job today. I've got a Wacom Mobile Studio Pro here. It's a fully fledged Windows computer, 16 gig of RAM, double overhead camshaft, everything on there. But it means that in the evenings I can open up my photographs, drop them into Photoshop or Capture One, and play. Take us through the process of this image. I was saying it almost looks like a phoenix. So how did yep. we get to that? This is sand. It's sand and yep. it's shot from the air. And so when we look at the picture, in real life, the sun's low, there's not much contrast, and so it's quite a flat image. But what I loved was the shape of the sand dunes. And so by lightening and darkening certain areas, and as, as we turn each layer on, you can see the image changing and morphing and becoming a little bit more like that phoenix shape. Yes. So when we look at the original picture, we can see the shape, but we don't necessarily know what the photographer intended. By lightening and darkening, by increasing colour, decreasing colour, changing colour a little bit, and how much is up to you, you can really enhance the image and it becomes more Bring like it to art. Life. Yeah. Yeah. 
And the reason that you use something like the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro or any of Wacom's pen and, and tablet devices is that when you're, when you're working on them, you're actually using a brush, an electronic brush, and then you're actually painting on the picture. Now, when you use a mouse, you're pushing your finger down and moving. Yeah. It's, it's very awkward. With this, I'm actually working on the picture, and I can see immediately what happens as the image lightens and darkens down or changes colour. Yeah. It is so much fun. I mean, yeah, I, I don't care what anybody says. I just like to sit there, <laughs> down there, and I just sit down and have fun. If I've got a glass of red wine, so much the better. But I realise this could be going to children, so it's it's just a... It's cordial. Oh, it's cordial. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Peter, for those post-production tips and thanks for joining us on Snap Happy. My pleasure. So, Mads, we've just started using a Wacom tablet in our post-production in the office and it's a really handy tool. And next week, we're going to find out how it can be used in your photographic workflow. Where off to next, Jace? Well, I just photographed an amazing event in Central Australia called the Uluru Camel Cup. It had to be seen to be believed. It was a lot of fun. And if you want to join our Snap Happy community, head over to snaphappytv.com for exclusive content, competitions and offers from our partners. See you next time on Snap Happy, the photography show. Peter East Razor, <laughs> almost got it. Over the years, Peter has won <laughs> I'm here at the Northern Beaches to 